Eight of hearts. You know me so well. You know me so well. Wow. Identity. Identity. Man. <laughs> so many funny things happen on this stage tonight. I feel like laughing for a while. But we're going to move on. We're just going to move. We're going to press on. Okay. <sighs> That's a good night so far, isn't it? Man, it's a good night. I'm excited to be preaching tonight. You guys look good. You're a great crowd. And uh, so, welcome. Welcome to this moment. Man, identity. Identity. You know, why, why are we doing a whole entire series on identity? You know why? It's because we have a major identity crisis in America right now. People don't know who they are. They don't know if they're a man or a woman anymore. They don't know if they're gay, straight, bi, transgender. What, who, what is happening? Who are people anymore? I, there is a major identity crisis happening right now in America. You know, when I, even in just doing research for this message tonight, something offended me on YouTube. I just was searching YouTube. I like to, to, to find maybe videos that support what I'm talking about. And so I just typed in on YouTube search, I am. And the first thing came up that, that the search bar came down, and one of the options, the very first option was, I am Kate. So I'm like, what is that? I click on it. Apparently, that's Bruce Jenner. Now it's Kate. And it's about her show called I Am Kate. Then the second one down, all I did was type in I am. The second one down was called I Am Jazz. I thought I was going to watch jazz music. No, it's about a little girl or a boy. I'm not quite sure. She's probably eight, or he is probably eight. And there's a TV show called I Am Jazz, and it's about a boy transitioning to a girl on Lifetime. What? All I typed in was I am. I am offended. I am offended, you know? I'm like, why? 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 There is such an identity crisis right now. And, and you know, I, I feel like there was, a, there was a time in my life where I went through an identity crisis, maybe not this huge, but you can relate to this identity, identity crisis. You know, I'm in high school, and I'm trying to figure out my skills. And I have talents, and I have giftings, and I recognize what my talents and, and what my giftings are. But they didn't seem to line up with what I felt like God was calling me to do. And I felt like I had a moment of crisis in my life where I want to go, I want to do something that I'm good at, Right? You know, like, you know, if you're a horrible singer, the last thing you want to do is get up in, th in front of thousands of people and be forced to sing. But if you're a good baseball player, you want to be put in front, of, in front of thousands of people to show off your skills. You know, and so we're all in this moment of, like, what am I gifted at? What am I talented at? What can I do? What do I have to offer? And I remember, I remember realizing what my giftings and my talents were, but I'm, then I realized God's not calling me to use any of those things. And it was, it was a frustrating season for my life. And at times I still get frustrated. You know, to be quite honest with you, you know, we're all different. But I was always really good at athletics. I remember I would, as a, even a young kid, I was always better than everybody else on a sports field. Soccer, I, 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 was, I didn't even have to try out for, my Michigan Nationals, for the Michigan National soccer team. There's always tryouts for the team. I didn't have to try out. The guy asked me to be on the team, and he said, you don't even need to try out. You're automatically on the team. You know, this is kind of how I lived my lifestyle growing up. And, and it, same with basketball. I, I was on varsity when I was a young kid, and I was doing good. I would score like 20 points a game. And, and I was always a good athletic, but then as I was getting older, God was calling me away from athletics, and he was calling me to read books <laughs> and study the Bible for a living. And it just wasn't deep down what I felt like I was born to do or what I was created to even do. And, and it was an identity crisis in my life. You know, did I miss the call of God? Is this what I'm supposed to do with my life? Who am I anyway? You know, and so I feel like, yes, there are moments of, of, of real crisis where we are trying to figure out what we want to do for the rest of our life. And there's 10 different roads to take, and we just don't know which way to go. And that's really a moment of crisis that many of us can have. And maybe you're right in the middle of that. You're like, I want to be a professional musician, but i got to make a living. And... I can't raise a family on, a, you know, touring the southeast of Michigan. Like, what do I do with this? How do I pursue this? How do I, this is a gift I have. 
Is this gift just supposed to be put on the shelf for the rest of my life now? What's going on? How do I navigate this process? You know, am I supposed to like just be an engineer, be a plumber when I have a gift as a musician? What is going on with my life? It's called an identity crisis. Who are you? What are you supposed to do? Can you figure it all out? And I've been there. I've been there. And there is a major identity crisis happening right now in America. Major identity crisis. And it goes well beyond that. You know, people don't know who, if they're even a man anymore. It's crazy. It's confusing. And it's pushed on us. And it's shoved at us. And, it, and it's causing us to, to really live in fear and live in doubt all the time. And there's a great story in the Bible about a, a young man named Joseph who, who really knew who he was despite despite really horrible negative circumstances and situations in his life. I'm talking horrible. You think you've had it bad. Joseph's had it worse. You know, just a quick overview of his life as a young kid. His brothers hated him so much, they took him out to a faraway place and sold him to slavery. And while he was in prison as a slave, he finally... (laughs) finally was able to to work his way up and gain trust with the prison guards and was put in charge of the prison eventually. Then as being in charge of the prison, he actually began to interpret dreams of the king, but the people that were supposed to help him get out of prison because he's such a great man forgot about him. He spent many more years in prison, finally gets out of prison, then gets put back and it's crazy. It's a crazy life he had. But despite it all, he knew who he was. And what we're going to do is we're just going to read a little bit of Joseph's life, and then we're going to really dissect what this thing is all about. And I believe it's going to create healing and hope for many of you in this place tonight. You guys ready for that? Let's do it. All right, so open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. Listen to this. Genesis 45, 1 through 8 says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So at this time in Joseph's life, he is finally, finally in a position where he is a ruler. He's he's almost considered a king at this point. He's in charge of almost the entire nation. It's incredible. And and there's a huge famine in the land. And he knew a famine was coming. He knew a seven-year famine was coming. And he had he had such like such a wise man he is. He convinced the Pharaoh and all of Egypt to store up seven years worth of food for the entire country to live on during the seven-year famine. How brilliantly awesome is this guy? It's like crazy cool, right? McDonald's can't even supply pigs for. Enough pigs for the, what's the, what's the sandwich? The McRib, right? Apparently the McRib only lasts for a season because they can't slaughter enough pigs to keep up demand. Do you know that? That's a true story. That's why it's only available for a certain amount of times because there's literally not enough pigs in the U.S. for it. But Joseph, someone's got to preach this, identity. But Joseph stores up food enough for an entire nation for seven years. And, and, and he hasn't seen his family for, for well over half of his entire life. As far as he knows, he'll never see his family ever again. But sure enough, his brothers came to him, came to the king's court asking for food because they were starving during the famine. And all of a sudden, his brothers are standing before him, and he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. Huh, identity. Identity. So let me start over. Verse 1, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Verse 4, And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me. You sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. 
For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. I hope you can hear as I'm reading this verse, Joseph describe himself. Wow. Do you hear how he describes himself? This is incredible. Let's just dive into this. Number one, the title of the message tonight is, is identity. But yes, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you tonight about how to speak your identity. How to speak your identity. I feel like, I feel like nobody beats you up more than yourself. Gosh, I remember I was loading stuff in and out of my car the other day, and the, the back hatch of my car doesn't go up as high as it used to go up. That, like, that air pressure is getting weaker. And so instead of like, you know, it goes, tss, and it'll go up high, and I, can, I could, used to be able to walk underneath my hatchback fully standing up. But now it's short about six inches, and I hit my head on it. And it was, I hit my head about three times on my door, loading boxes in and out and things like that. I just get so mad. I'm like, you're an idiot. And I just slam the door, you know. I'm, I'm calling myself an idiot, you know. And, and nobody beats me up more than me. You know, nobody calls me a loser as many times as I do in the course of a week. You know what I'm saying? And, and so we're going to talk about how to speak your identity, how to speak over your life. So here we go. Number one, what does Joseph do? It's so simple, but what does he say to his brothers? He says, I am Joseph. I am Joseph. He just says his name. You know, it's interesting. My wife's name, as many of you know her, as Jen. But did you know that's that's not her name? Her name is Mary. Her name is her name is Mary. And all of you are like, if she were here tonight, she wouldn't be able to walk out those doors because I would cripple her right now, you know? You're like, my life is a lie right now. You know, her name is Mary. Her name is Mary. Her name's not Jen. Her middle name is Jennifer. First name is Mary. Mary Jennifer, when I met her, Mary Jennifer Hedges. Now you know her as Jen Forstoff. That's how many of you know her. Her real name is Mary. And now listen, she doesn't like it. She doesn't like that her parents named her Mary but called her Jen. Because anytime you go to the doctor's office, it's very confusing. <laughs> anytime you go to the bank, this is very hard. Try getting a loan. Is this you? Well, no, wait, yes. Huh? Wait, who's that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's tough. It's confusing. Her name's all mixed up. No, and nobody calls her Mary. Nobody knows her as Mary, but that is, that is her name. And it's interesting how she gets frustrated. And I always mess with her because obviously our kids have first names and middle names, and I always, I always mess with her. I'm going to say, I'm going to start calling our kids by, our, by their middle names. She says, you better not. You better not. You have no idea my life's been like. My, 30 years of my life I've dealt with this. No, don't, don't let her kid go through what I've gone through my whole entire life. And so a name is very important. He just clearly says, I am Joseph. You know, do you know your name? Do you know your name? I looked up my name in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> now, <laughs> careful. If you don't mind profanity, go ahead and look it up. And because uh, it's, it's awesome. You know, Urban Dictionary is very either going to make you feel great or it's going to make you feel horrible. So I, I took a risk. I looked up my name in the Urban Dictionary, and it made me feel good. Apparently, I've got a great name. But listen to some of the things that the Urban Dictionary had to say about me. The name Lucas. My name's Lucas. It says this, and I quote, Lucas is the most amazing person you will ever meet. (laughs) Yes. Blessed. I'm so blessed right now. I feel it. Oh, what else does it say about me? It says Lucas is sweet. Kind. And beautiful. Lucas will, br- will bring light to your life and love to your heart. And all my friends say, yes, he does. Now, I do have a biblical meaning as well to my name. 
and it's, it's my biblical meaning of Lucas is light of God, bringer of light. Light of God, bringer of light. Um, now, it says here also in the Urban Dictionary, people with this na- name tend to be balanced and receptive to cooperation. They are the ideal partner and seek peace. Now, here's a sentence commonly used in my name. I love my Lucas. He is my sweet angel baby. That's, <laughs> come on, people. Now, I, I, know, I know my name. I know what my name means, and boy, I like it. You know what I'm saying? And it's important to know your name. It really is. I think it's important to know your name. You know, I had a, I had a football coach growing up that I hated. And you know why I hated him? It's because he never called me by my name. He called me, hey, worthless. Yeah, pretty horrible, huh? Hey, hey, no good, nothing. That's how he would, that's how he would address me. <laughs> no, somebody else did, actually. <laughs> and he ended up getting fired from the team and from the school. But you know what? It's important that you know your name and that people call you by your name. It's so important, I believe. It's, the, it's who you are. It's who you are. You know, Bruce Jenner, it's, it's all about his name change. I am Kate. And he's trying to get it legally changed. It's because there is power in a name. And if people continually call him Bruce, he'll never be able to fully transition. And he knows it. You know, what's your name? What is it? I hope you know what your name is. Number two, the second thing he says here. He says, I am your brother. Why is this important? You know, sometimes just admitting who you are and where you come from can heal you a lot. You know, sometimes just admitting you are the brother or the sister of so-and-so or the son or the daughter of so-and-so is good for you. It's true, though, but that you can be embarrassed for about your family. You can be embarrassed about where you've come from. I hopped on Ancestry.com today because I wanted to look up my my ancestry. And I couldn't get very far with my free trial. So I called my parents. and And I talked to my dad first. And I couldn't get very far with my dad. So I talked to my mom. And my mom ended up knowing more about her side of the family than my dad did. And, and she starts to unveil to me the story of my family. And it's a sad story. She's the first person in her entire family, my mom is, to graduate from college. All of her relatives grew up very, very poor in the hills in the countryside of Tennessee. Many of my family members died at a very young age because of alcoholism, drug use, and just poor behavior. And honestly, a bit of lack of oversight, lack of parenting caused many young kids to die. Story has it that her, my great grandpa was a truck driver for the coal mines in the hills of Tennessee. And he was at the house one day driving his truck around and he backed over and killed his young daughter. And this is my, this is my family. This is my heritage. And it was swept under, under, the, under the rug as quickly as possible. But apparently my great-grandmother took the bloody clothes that she died in under that car and put them under her seat and just kept them there for the rest of her life. I don't know why. And, and, and they never talked about it. They never addressed it. But that's my heritage. That's some of my lineage right there. You know, but sometimes it's embarrassing to say, I am the brother of so-and-so. I am the son of so-and-so. Why? Because sometimes your father or your brother or sister or your mother is a bad person. It can be true. And you don't want to admit where you've come from or who you belong to or where you were raised. Sometimes my mom doesn't like to admit her family. There's pain there. There's, there's, there's lack of love. There's abuse. There's, there's real pain there. And it can be a dark and hard thing to unfold to people. But Joseph says, I am your brother. He admits it. And I want to say this tonight. 
that it's hard to move forward if you don't acknowledge where you come from. It can be very difficult to move forward if you don't acknowledge where you've come from. A third thing here about speaking your identity. This is what Joseph says. He says, I am going to preserve you. I am going to preserve you. That's what he says to his brothers. So I want to ask you a few questions tonight. Joseph realized the power he had. Because why? He had power. He had real power. He was put in a position and given a title. And with that title and that position, he truly had power. And he spoke this over them. He said, I am going to preserve you. Now, here's my first question to you tonight. Do you know the power you have? Do you know the power you have? Do you have younger brothers and sisters that you've neglected? That you've been, that you've been maybe shying away from and haven't been a good older brother or older sister to? Do you realize that, that you have such great power as an older sibling to your younger siblings? You have such influence. You have such power. You, you can really, really have great influence on a younger brother or sister. And I really want to encourage you tonight that you have power to create great change in this world. You have power to create a great movement around you. You have power to have a great positive influence on the people around you. You have great power. But most people don't realize how much power they actually have, how much influence they actually have. Here's another second question I have for you. goes right along with what I'm saying. Do you know the influence you have? Do you understand the influence that you have on people? Somebody looks up to you. Somebody loves you. Somebody wants to hear you speak. Somebody's seeking advice from you. Somebody is. Are you, are you really, really taking care of that responsibility that you've been given? And Joseph clearly, clearly lays it out to him, I am going to preserve you. He realizes the power and the influence he has, and he's going to use it for good. He also has the power to not just preserve them. He has the power to kill them if he wants to. And I'm wondering if he's ever had thoughts of just murderous thoughts towards his brothers who sold him into slavery as a young boy. I wonder if he's ever had those thoughts. At this point, he's not struggling anymore with them. He says, I am going to preserve you. Wow. A fourth thing that we see here. He says, I am going to save your life. I am going to save your life. Do you know the resources you have? Do you know the resources that are at your disposal? Do you know that you, you potentially, even just growing up in the church, you have so many resources that the world is begging and pleading for? I'll give you one. You know Jesus. And the, and the greatest thing people lack in this world is Jesus. And they don't even know it. But they're searching, and they're searching, and they're striving to, 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 to get something. And they don't know how to get satisfaction in it. But it's only found in Jesus. And you have that. Do you, you have that resource within you. You have it. Do you know the leadership capabilities you have? Do you know, what, do you know that inside of you is a leader begging to come out? Do you realize that inside of you is so much more than maybe what you're tapping into? You know, I love the science of the brain. And, and I love the movie Limitless. It's one of my favorite movies. It's so intensely awesome. But the idea that, that apparently, and this actually technically isn't true, they used to say you only use 10% of your brain, which I think Myth, Mythbusters disproved, and they said you actually use about 35% of your brain. Now listen, you, you, what if you had the capability of tapping into 100% of your brain, which is the idea of limitless? What could you accomplish? How many things could you remember? Every little article, every little blog, every little picture you ever saw would just, boom, come to your memory like that quickly. And you'd be pulling out resources and information and ideas like crazy all the time, right? That, that excites me to think about that. And how many people have seen the, the things spreading around Facebook that apparently, apparently, the FDA or somebody like that is, is going to approve a drug that is very similar to the concept of the idea of limitless. So 
What? I don't know. I don't know, but that excites me. I mean, I'm not going to take it, but that excites me. I mean, maybe I will take it. I just won't tell you. <laughs> if all of a sudden I become a millionaire overnight, you can assume. Mm-mm-mm. You know, I'm taking drugs or something, I guess. <laughs> But do you understand? Have you tapped fully into everything that's inside of you? Or, or, are you just wasting away and just sitting on the couch watching TV all day? Are you, are you, are you, you know, only taking 10 credits this semester? When you know you could be taking 18, you know you could handle a full load. You know if you'd give it everything you got, you could graduate in four years. But you've just decided to. Not push it because you just might not succeed. Don't live like that. Don't live like that. Don't live life like that. Go stretch. Go beyond. Realize that inside of you is a natural born leader that is begging to come out. Inside of you are ideas and capabilities and things. Inside of you is the ability to save somebody's life. But you just might be letting a fear stand in your way because you might fail. Who cares if you fail? What? Oh, what? You failed. So what? Try again. I mean, who really, at the end of the day, cares? Just you. Just you. So go for it. Realize that, speak it over your life, I am going to save someone's life. Man, I like that. I like that Joseph says that. Do you know that you know more than you realize? You know more than you realize. Man, don't you love it when you're taking that exam? This rarely happens, but you're taking the exam, and all of a sudden, the answers that you didn't even know you knew are coming into your head. You're like, oh, my gosh. How did I remember, you know, who the vice president of, you know, such and such a weird president was? You know, tap. How did I remember the vice president of TAP? How? How did that come into my brain? I can't believe it. And you're all excited because you're taking your humanities exam. You know, I love when that kind of stuff happens. I love when all of a sudden you remembered that thing while you're taking an exam. You know, do you, do you, do you realize that you actually know more than you realize? Come on. Come on. Think about it. Tap into it. Get, get there. And, and I love this, the last thing that Joseph says. It's kind of a combination of three things here. He says, I am a father to Pharaoh. I am Lord of all his house. And I am a ruler. So Pharaoh, that's what Joseph says. Gosh, this guy's full of confidence. Even though everything about his life says there's no way he should be. He should be confused. He should be lost. He should be dead. He should not be in this situation. He was sold into slavery. Now we second in command of the largest nation in the entire world. How? Gosh, he knew how to, Joseph knew how to speak over his life. Joseph knew the capabilities that he, that he had. Joseph knew. He knew there was greatness on the inside of him. Woo. You know, when you know who you are and whose you are, It's a difference maker. When you know who you are and whose you are, it's a difference maker. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, as a pastor, I I I just find it one of my one of the most fun things that I can do as a pastor is is to see great potential in somebody that, that they don't see in, them, in themselves and getting them to the point where I had saw them from the beginning. Like, like seeing somebody who walks through the door and everything about them seems insecure. Everything about them seems timid. They, they, they seem confused about life, but I can tell there's something great on the inside of them. And I love as a pastor pulling out the greatness from the inside of them, pushing them, and turning them into leaders who are not timid, who are confident, who are brave, who are passionate about life now. That's one of the most fun things to do as a pastor. 
I love it. You know, sometimes I just wish that you could see yourself as we see you at times, as us pastors. You know, we see that you could do more. And I wish everybody saw that in themselves. I wish they could see it. I wish that they could see that they're gonna that they're gonna be a great father. I wish they could see that they're gonna be a great pastor one day. I wish they could see that they're gonna be a great worship leader. I wish that they could see that they're that they're gonna be a pillar in the church, that they're gonna lead, lead men and lead women, that they're gonna be awesome. I, I wish that they could see it in themselves. And so this message is just to get you there, to get you to see what's on the inside of you, who you really are. You know, when you know who you are and whose you are, number one, I got four quick things here. You know your power. When you know who you are and whose you are, you know your power. You know your power. Number two, you know your authority. Number three, you have confidence. And number four, you know your destination. You know your power. You know your authority. You know your confidence. And you know your destination. When you know who you are and whose you are, you know your power. You know your authority. You know your confidence. You know your destination. And I want you just to, just to, just to grasp it. Some of you are going, yeah, I get it now. I get it now because it's taken, me, it's taken me a long time. It's taken me a long time, but I get it now. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. And I want to read one last verse to you, and then we're going to worship. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. It says, Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. You are holy, you are blameless as you stand before Jesus Christ without a single fault. Now, I just want you to just forget about your sins and your mistakes. And I want you to just, just for a second, humor me. And just think to yourself and say, I've never sinned. And I've never made a mistake. I've never done anything wrong. And you could for a moment feel the confidence rise up in you. And if, and if you lived like that all the time, how would you carry yourself? How? Man, wouldn't you walk around with an authority and a power and a confidence with your destination in mind? Because that's how Jesus sees you, holy and blameless as you stand before him right now. Why? It's called the power of his death on the cross. It wiped away every sin. It wiped away every mistake. It made a way for you into heaven. There was a huge gap between you and God, and Jesus died, and as his body laid down, it created that bridge to God. And that bridge never goes down. It never disappears. It never goes away. It's always there. The access is constantly there. And it's only because of Jesus Christ that you are considered holy and blameless as you stand before him. Think about that. Think about what God calls you. Think about what Jesus did for you. Now walk it out. Walk it out. Forget about your sins and your mistakes. Put them in the past and run forward. Sprint forward as if you are never going to do them ever again. Just do it. Just do it. That's your identity. That's who you are.